This is reproduction, parenthood and the art world. Um, this is something that I've been working on for quite a number of years now, uh, since 2017, in fact. Um, I personally don't have children and I'm starting to get to an age where a lot of my friends do or are questioning whether or not to have children. Um, and it became quite apparent to me that there's still a lot of that conversation about whether or not we is, is mostly female, and I think everybody actually that's on here is female, um, is as to how you balance that. How can you make it work? Can you make it work? That, that old idea that if you, you want an artistic practice, you can't have children. What, what can we do to change that to make you more inclusive in the arts? Um, it's been quite interesting, given that I've not been able to, to get the funding um, and to, to make this event happen until now. Um, to see how much of a change has happened since 2017, um, of how much more people are open to discussing um, motherhood in particular, uh, but also parenthood in the arts. Um, a lot of that, I think, has to do with the, uh, the, the pandemic, um, unfortunately. But I suppose it's one of the good things that have come out of it is people understanding that we need to have more of a work-life balance. Uh, so I have two fantastic speakers here today. Um, we're starting off today with Hetty Judah who is a art critic and she's written for Freeze, um, for Art Review, Art Monthly. You've written several books as well. Um, and today, <laughs> just the list keeps going. Uh, today you're gonna um, give us a bit of a, a preview, a bit of a sneak preview of your book that comes out on the 25th of September, uh, which is called How Not to Exclude uh, Artist Mothers uh, and Other Parents. I first came about your work on the chat that you did with Freelance, Freelance Foundation. Um, that, that talk is still available, if anybody wants to view it, it's on their Vimeo page. Um, and then after Hetty's talk, we're gonna pass over to Natasha, who is an artist, she's an educator, uh, and she's also set up Workshop Grow, which is online, um, not specifically to photography, mostly photographers, but it is open to other people as well. Um, education program. So we're going to get cracking with Eddie. I'll pass over to you. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> what a level of professionalism I am playing right now. That was impressive. Um, thank you so much, Andrea. And um, congratulations on getting this off the ground. And um, I'm really honoured to be uh, in the first batch of speakers um, for this event. So this is uh, quite a terrifying um, experience for me because I'm about to share a bit of a book that is it, not even hot off the press, it's not even at the press yet, it's still being copy edited. Um, so, but it has been approved and it's, it should all be okay. Um, so this, this is a book called How Not to, Ex How Not to Exclude Artist Mothers and Other Parents. Uh, it's published by Lund Humphreys and it's part of their hot topics in the art world and which is kind of really interesting because the other books published in that series have all been to do with the art market um, and kind of really newsworthy issues and this is a bit of a departure for them and I think they were a little apprehensive about doing you know a kind of soft subject but it's um they're really pleased with it anyway so the book in general starts um with the data that I gathered a few years ago when I did a study of um, interviews with 50 artist mothers um, and that study really identified um, lots of the issues that artist mothers uh, faced and so this book kind of starts where the study finishes to an extent it it identifies the issues and then it tries to look at things that we might do in the art world to make uh, the situation better and to make it less excluding to artist mothers and other parents um, and the book is structured to look really at all different sections of the, or many different sections of the art world. I obviously can't look at all different sections of the art world. It's quite a short book. Um, so it starts off with a historic overview, looking at why there is this prejudice around motherhood. It then takes a look at the current situation and the kind of the art world culture that mothers face. Um, and then we look at the situation in art schools, um, how motherhood, parenthood affects people's studio practice. Um, it looks at residencies and why residencies are important and how residencies can be less excluding. Uh, it looks at commercial galleries and talks about why commercial galleries should care about artist mothers or care about motherhood in general. And it looks at institutions and then it kind of rounds up with looking at maybe some more radical suggestions 
had to do with um you know assuming vulnerability in everyone working in the art world rather than treating everyone as if they're financially independent carefree people um so the section that i'm going to read now it's an abridged version of the chapter on art schools and i've obviously this isn't everything that's in the chapter i've had to cut it down for the presentation because i've only got 25 minutes um so there are various things that aren't going to be covered here but i hope this gives you a flavor of what it's like and it's uh, yeah it's quite terrifying going ahead and reading this in front of an audience but here we go the chapter two art school in Renee Cox's Yo Mama series made in the mid 1990s, the artist presents her body to the camera in various states of motherhood, pregnant, nursing, flanked by one young child and then two. In many, she is naked or partially so, strong and self-possessed. Rather than a meek and luscious virgin and child, here is the mother as athlete and intellectual. Cox is not receiving our gaze, she is commanding it. Cox made your mama while enrolled in the Whitney Museum's independent study program in New York. Studies started in September, and in October, she found out that she was expecting her second child. Apparently, I was the first woman in their 25 year history to be pregnant in the, in the program, Cox told me when I interviewed her a couple of years ago. Her announcement was not met with delight, either by her tutors or by her fellow students at the Whitney. The assumption was that Cox's pregnancy was an accident, a cause for commiseration rather than for celebration. Looking back on the experience, she recalls, here I am in this heavy intellectual theorized world and people are looking at me like, how can you get pregnant? And I'm saying to them, this is my second child. This is planned parenthood. Cox's second pregnancy came in 1992, just after Mira Shaw and Susan B's magazine, Meaning, and that's M-E-A-N-I-N-G, with hyphens and with dashes in between them, if you want to look it up, had published a special report called On Motherhood, Art and Apple Pie. A broad group of artist mothers had written responses on negotiating the art world. Some were hilariously acerbic. Barbara Pollock described attending private views pregnant. Dealers and critics gave me the cold shoulder, but who could blame them, she wrote. Such refined sensibility should not have to gaze on the unesthetic form of a short pregnant woman. But the deepest story the accounts revealed was of struggle and prejudice. Cox came from a background in fashion photography. Reading on motherhood art and apple pie, she realized there was this stigma that as a woman artist, motherhood could be a career killer. Rather than challenging the stigma, the response of students and faculty at the st study program reinforced it. The idea that Cox's pregnancy was considered inappropriate as a grown woman studying art, she says, was shocking. I had a reaction and the reaction was your mama, which was basically, okay, let me just show you what motherhood can look like. Art school is often where our foundational ideas about what art can be and what it is to be an artist are formed. For students, the experience can be turbulent, brutal, political and testing, but art school is also where ideas are exchanged, new avenues opened and bonds formed. When role models are limited and certain subjects for art are either invisible or belittled, this has an impact. Not seeing yourself or the ideas that interest you reflected in this environment suggests that you and they fall outside the boundaries of what exciting and current art might be. Historically, sexist attitudes within art school have been bound up without, <clears throat> sorry, historically sexist ideas, sorry, I need to have a cup of tea. Historically, sexist attitudes within art school have been bound up with ideas about maternity. Billy de Barlow recalls a tutor at the slave school in the 1960s, the sculptor Reg Butler, informing her that he wouldn't take much interest in teaching her because by the time you're 30, you'll be having babies and making jam. Today, that almost reads as comic, but it would be easier to laugh if such attitudes had long since vanished. Far from it. According to an artist and academic working in Northern Ireland, who asked to remain anonymous, we'll call her May. Res Responding to my study, May told me, a former colleague of mine as recently as 2014 pointed to a book on my office bookshelf about mother artists and said he always made a point to tell each year group that the girls shouldn't have children because their careers would be over and they'd have nothing to say anymore. A frighteningly large part of my work as an art lecturer involves reassuring female students 
that their subject matter is valid after they've been told, we don't do women's issues. You're too emotional. The subject is too difficult or we don't do art therapy here. I've heard female colleagues described as not committed because they have children who might have them soon." End quote. As Daniel Gowen reported in the online magazine Hyperallergic, similar attitudes pervade MFA programs in the US. Gowen describes three contemporaries at the University of Pennsylvania in 2009 and 2010, being told by a specific faculty member that, quote, most successful female artists are either childless or lesbians, end quote. Gowen describes how the family taboo prevalent in MFA programs can extend to the artwork as well. The artist Delina Tenser describes how mummy work was a term used in critiques, as in, it's great that you're not making mummy work. It was clearly something icky and embarrassing, she remembers. Alina Tentz was particularly sensitive to critiques of mummy work because she was attending the MFA as a young mother. There were no professors who had children of any age, she remembers. And just as representation matters with sexual orientation, race and gender, it was hard not to see my experience being reflected back to me. Tentz graduated from Virginia Commonwealth University in 2012 a school that she'd selected because out of all the programs she'd been accepted onto, it was the only school that offered a year's deferral because she was pregnant. She's not alone in that experience. One artist in my study was offered a place at London's postgraduate Royal College of Art in the late 1990s, but had to cede her place when the school refused to allow her to defer for a year when she found out she was pregnant. Another artist in the study from Sao Paulo was permitted just one month's maternity leave to give birth and was too scared to ask for more in case she was thrown off the course. The physical presence of mothers within the student body is a pressing issue because education within an increasingly professionalized art world is now a protracted phenomenon. For art studies in the UK, you're required to take a year's foundation course before applying to your three or four year BA. Returning for an MA or MFA used to be a rarity, but is increasingly standard. The artists often pause for a few years between the two. This trend isn't confined to artists. In the US, the average age of graduate students is 33. There is thus a significant likelihood that an artist will attend an MA or an MFA during the period she may also be thinking about starting a family. It is easy to tuck disapprovingly and ask why, in an era of planned parenthood, artists can't time pregnancies not to clash with their studies. But the human body is not a machine and pregnancy is rarely so predictable. Women who have suffered miscarriages or have spent years struggling to conceive may feel that they can't put their lives on hold indefinitely, waiting for a pregnancy they fear may never come. In such a case, not only might it be a surprise for the artist to discover she is pregnant, she may also wish to take extra time and care to give herself the best chance of carrying her child to term. It is an interesting measure of how toxic this arena is that a remarkable number of interviewees speaking about experiences with academic institutions asked to remain anonymous. Five years ago, an artist we should call Vibeka moved to London from Europe following the dream offer of a place at the Royal College of Art. In the second year of the course, she discovered she was pregnant. This was 2019, by the way, this is very recently. I wanted to take leave as soon as I found out, she remembers. The studio is not the healthiest environment. My work is very physical and involves a lot of dust and chemicals. The college did not allow Yubika to take leave. She was told she had to finish her year and write a dissertation. If not, she would essentially lose everything she had worked and paid for up to that point. She was not granted an extension on the dissertation. Their answer was, you're not ill. There's nothing wrong with you. You're just pregnant, said Yubika, remembering one occasion in which she had to give a presentation standing up in 36 degree heat. There was no mercy, she says. At the time, she blamed herself for not managing everything. It didn't occur to her that the college could have behaved differently. She simply felt trapped by the complexities of her situation. It took me years to get over this, she told me. I still feel sick when I drive past the Royal College of Art. Every college has its own policy. Others are more flexible and permit students to defer or to pause their studies. Some artists have had great experiences with colleges being supportive and understanding even offering subsidized childcare once students returned. Changes often happen as a result of challenges from students, but not all students feel empowered to make such challenges. 
For too many, the underlying message broadcast to them by their college is the same one received by Rene Cox. Art school education is not designed for maternity. The art student cannot also be a mother. The exclusion encountered in the art school is twofold. First, we have the question of how motherhood as a lived condition might be better accommodated. Secondly, we have the related question of how maternity might become more present and better accepted as a subject for art and academic study. Sorry. The first question is perhaps more easily addressed. As a first gesture, art schools can become more flexible, allowing students to defer either the start of their studies or during their studies for up to two years, not just for pregnancy, but for personal reasons that extend to physical and mental health requirements and a range of caregiving responsibilities. A student should not have to fight for this. It should be straightforward to achieve and there should be assistance provided because the college should intuit that any student requesting such a deferment is likely to be going through a difficult and complicated time. In the UK, the 2010 Equality Act strengthened legal protection for students. Pregnancy and maternity are considered to be, quote, protected characteristics, and the Act prohibits discrimination on these grounds. It should be standard practice for colleges to allow students to defer their studies and for special provision to be made to meet the needs of pregnant women. Any college promoting postgraduate study needs to prepare itself for the presence of mothers within its student body. Many returning to study after giving birth will need a clean, welcoming room in which to pump breast milk. While not all mothers choose or are able to breastfeed, those who do, UNICEF guidelines suggest that babies need six months of exclusive breastfeeding. And this is a quote from UNICEF's guidelines. That is without other liquid foods and should therefore continue breastfeeding with the addition of other foods until the age of two or older. Just to make that clear, that suggests that you should make provision for mothers for up to two years after giving birth so that they can express milk in your place of work or in a college. UNICEF also details the responsibility of employers to provide suitable facilities for nursing, for nursing mothers. A well-ventilated private space with a comfortable upright chair, functioning sink, electricity, and dedicated storage for expressed milk. Pumping is necessary, but time consuming. To maintain a mother's milk yield, to keep her comfortable, milk needs to be expressed every two to four hours, as often as she would feed her baby. It's a process that can take between 15 and 30 minutes each time. There are international guidelines for employers that in theory should also apply to higher educational institutions responsible for a student body. Kia Bentford became pregnant during her third year at St. Jos School of Art and Design in the Netherlands. Returning to her graduating year after giving birth, she confronted the taboo that surrounds motherhood in art head on, but was also struck by her invisibility as a mother within the student body. She came to realize that the mother-shaped hole in the art world already starts in the breast pumping room at the art school. The small metal room, sorry, the small room with the metal bed, the empty walls, the window that was glued and taped with opaque plastic and blocked my view of the outside world. A room where there is no network connection and where the cleaner in the two weeks that I stayed there three times a day did not once come to clean. The isolation that she felt in the lactation room felt emblematic of the absence of any discussion of motherhood within the curriculum. None of my classmates knew there was a pumping room in the academy. Even some of the teachers were unfamiliar with it, she says. I felt invisible in the pumping room at the art school, invisible to the other mothers, invisible to my son, inaudible to my mother, invisible to fellow students, invisible to teachers, invisible to the missing lectures and the conversations about motherhood in the arts. Bentford points out that St. Just is unusually friendly and progressive, that it even has lactation facilities is in itself commendable and unusual. During subsequent research, Bentford invited other mothers and art schools in the Netherlands into a conversation with her around this topic. She says, it became clear that the problem is not only the invisibility of mothers in the curriculum, for example, but that mothers are not even accepted when they apply at the schools because they are mothers. There is circularity here. Maternal spaces such as lactation rooms are not well designed, precisely because maternity is absent from art and design curricula. Later in the book, I talked to curator Michelle Miller-Fisher about the Designing Motherhood project, but I'd like to draw on her experience here too. Over the last 15 years, she's taught studio arts, art history and business majors at schools from the city university systems in New York to Harvard to Parsons and the New School. 
Thanks to Fisher and her colleagues, a course on designing motherhood is now a curriculum intervention in the University of Pennsylvania's design program. I asked her prior to that how visible motherhood was in art and design curricula. Maybe only Mary Kelly was mentioned in passing in a survey textbook, Fisher told me, but no, this is not something that was at all visible. In other words, motherhood is not considered as a topic in design schools. After finding the art world suddenly hostile following the birth of her first child in 2009, Martina Mullaney formed an artist mother discussion group named after Cyril Connolly's quip that, there is no, no more somber enemy of good art than the pram in the hall. Enemies of good art engaged in radical actions and discussions. As Mullaney's research around the subject deepened, it became the foundation for a PhD that, quote, identifies the mother as missing from the canon that is feminism and art history, traced through anthologies, conferences, group exhibitions dedicated to feminism and art. In April 2021, Mullaney organized the Missing Mothers Conference at the University of Bolton. I'm sure many of you listening today attended it, so I won't go into the conference in detail, except to note that abuses of power shared, exclusionary behavior by academic co colleagues was made public, forms of protest and dissent were discussed. Many of the presentations felt like a call to arms. Mullaney's own paper asked how all of this energy around the subject of motherhood might be made visible within the wider art world. The 12 years since she had founded Enemies of Good Art had coincided with a flourishing of activity around the subject internationally. There was now an informal network of support groups, podcasters, academics and curators exploring the subject. But all the exhibitions and discussions seemed to take place within an artist mother echo chamber. Art and writing on maternity operates in spaces and initiatives dedicated to the subject, writes Mullaney, a form of feminist separatism by default. The big question now, and the one at the heart of her PhD research was, quote, how art on and of maternity might transcend its own audience. Artists like Renee Cox, Martina Mullaney, and Helen Benningson, whose work is covered in the book, but I didn't have time to discuss today, show how fundamental ideas about art and the art world that we encountered during our student years might be different. The art school is a powerful arena for change. This is where different models for being and for making art can be tested and new archetypes made visible. Much, however, still rests on the, administra on the administrative structures of the schools themselves, adapting to the needs of their student bodies. Thank you, I shall end it there. Thank you very much. I'm uh, very looking forward to reading this book. I think it's going to have a lot of um, interesting little nuggets in it. It's quite interesting as well. My um, my day job, I work with a lot of architects. And whilst there is a shift um, in that discipline for more women coming into it, there's still mostly men, and it's mostly men who are at the top of architecture firms. And it's amazing how much that impacts on the design of a building. So things like lactation rooms is probably not even something that they would even dream of thinking about because it's not it's not something that they, they need so it's it's you know this is why women see there's always a cure for the women's this is why <laughs> yeah <laughs> thank you very much uh, i'm going to pass over to natasha now who's it's got a slideshow i believe you want to share Sorry, sorry, Natasha, you're on mute. <laughs> I've done the same. We've only been in a pandemic two years and we're still... <laughs> okay, now I will start again. Um, thank you again. Um, so with this presentation, I'm going to talk about a, a few pieces of work. I'm gonna talk about Work Show Grow School, which was a, a platform that I founded when I when I found out I was pregnant essentially it became a school and that process of keep going like keep going <laughs> is what I've titled this talk because that's kind of how I feel right now um, and just to mention that I can't actually see the chat box so if there's any questions we can bring that up in the Q&A section just put my timer on <clears throat> Uh, 
Um, so making it work, for me, making it work really is um, a bit of a puzzle. And I definitely, you know, I've got my art practice and then I also have work show grow. And amongst that, I have my family responsibilities. So I have one daughter, um, Suki, who is one year and one month old. And this is her. <laughs> so this is where I'm currently from right now. I'm talking to you from my studio up in Margate. And I think there was a particular set of circumstances that happened to me, which kind of makes me feel like I listening to those stories of um, those awful accounts of the reality of being a mother and an artist. I really felt like I have bypassed a lot of that being pregnant during the pandemic. I actually made a decision um, because I had a really challenging pregnancy. I didn't know I'd get full term is I didn't actually tell many people at all. Um, because it was just a conversation I didn't need to have. And when I was showing up for work, I just wanted it to be about work. And I think I only let my work know on the last day that they possibly could find out, much to their dismay, of um, when I had to tell them that I was pregnant for them to find a replacement. And then also uh, cover. And then also with Work Show Grow, I, yeah, I just wanted to turn up and have the energy of Work Show Grow, which I'm about to talk about what that is in, in a second. And that was really an escape for me. And for me, that worked. That worked me coming and, and turning up as though I was still Natasha. And I wasn't somebody that said, oh, you're getting big or oh, not long now, banter, 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 down the corridor. Because obviously I wasn't going to work. We were all working online and that was absolutely fantastic for me. So during the, when I found out I was pregnant in the end of May, it was, um, or July, it was a complete shock to me. And I didn't ever think that, you know, I was going to be, you know, I was going to have a baby in, in my life. And, you know, it was it was a lovely gift from the universe. But how was it going to work for me? And I'd always decided that when I if I ever had a baby, I would probably leave my family in London, which is, you know, it's very disruptive. And I knew that being pregnant would probably throw up a lot of feelings and memories from my own childhood and I just thought actually that isn't an environment I particularly want to bring a child into so finding out I had to have a discussion with my husband of how are we actually going to do it you know the nuts and bolts of day to day and I love what I do um you know and we decided that we would go 50 50 so 50 50 on work and 50 50 on child care and because Simon's job worked in the theatre and worked in publishing um, you know everything during the pandemic had closed and it wasn't we weren't sure about how things were going to open up you know even though he worked for the national worked with the national theatre primarily even the national theatre hadn't opened their doors yet so we had to be quite entrepreneurial of how can we make this this happen so we had been doing a lot of work online um, and doing workshops and we decided to formulate and formalize what we were doing and make it into a school that was also really, really responsive to what's happening in the world, really, you know, really able to be flexible and respond to different people's environments, different people's pressures, because the, the canon, the sitting inside an academic institution such as UAL, where I, I work, University Arts London, it is a bit of a beast and we have to plan our curriculum, you know, years in advance. It's very prescriptive. And by setting up something, something on our set by ourselves, we could be very malleable. And that's what was so exciting about it. So we have a uh, group mentorship. So we do two mentorship sessions a month. We have an expert workshop. We have um, working in progress crits where we have artists coming from around the world, talking about their work in progress every month. And in the school, we have about you know, 120 artists from 30 different countries. And you know, we have that constant bit of support using a Slack channel. So at any time you can ask a question about how things work. And it's been really amazing to support people at different levels. It's not about you having to be, you know, you've got to have a solo show and that's how you get in, or there's not an age restriction. It's open to anybody. And we've had people that have only just you know, been playing with art and through the school after a year, they've gone on to start a degree and equally people that are returning to art. Um, and for me, I found that 
it was so fantastic to have that flexibility myself. And it's almost as though I was a case study as a new mother using a different alternative platform for art. Even though I had founded it, I was turning up as an artist and using it myself. And it gave me so much connection and momentum. And there was a few mothers in the Work Show Grow school at the time. And I hadn't told them I was pregnant, obviously. And they were turning up they were listening in to the online sessions whilst walking their babies, cradling their babies to sleep, walking the streets. And I saw those images and they were so powerful. And I had such a feeling of being able to see this in action, to have role models of how to make it work. And that really forefronted how I wanted Workshow Grow to evolve, of being able to have resources that are flexible, being able to offer artists that can pick what they want when they want. So, you know, is it going to be about me showing up that month and talking about my work? Or is it about me being a little bit quieter and maybe just using the resources library and watching things back when I can watch back? And that's something that I did a lot. You know, I was even the invited guest when I was feeding in the night, I would just listen to one of the resources. And it was really just kind of kept me a little bit in my other entity as an artist, as long as being a mother. And it made it seem as though I hadn't got to pick one or another. It became a flux between the both. And I think technology really enabled that. And this entrepreneurial way of having support for your art and knowledge for your art, not traveling to a big institution that felt very dominated and very masculine. I was able to just do it as and when. So we have kind of different seasons and again that helps us keep really fresh with what we're doing so we have every three months we have a different emphasis and the three months we are looking at right now is called confidence and confidence looks at many different ways and particularly we look at not just professional development but we also look at personal development which I think is something that's greatly missed in the in the institutional you know the formal academic world is that People have, you know, people are humans, people have problems, people ebb and flow. Why don't we talk about, you know, having imposter syndrome? Why don't we talk about how you can publicly speak? Why don't we talk about when you have, you know, how can you set up your day to, to, to work? How can you set up your day to have a positive mindset? We've had, um, we have Tommy Ludgate, for example, coming in, talking to us about, she's a creative coach, talking to us about imposter syndrome. We have people coming in talking about how does art therapy work? So I think that that, again, is another really quite distinct element to Work Show Grow that you wouldn't get in a traditional art school. And actually, I do hope that, I mean, I can't really ever see it, but during the pandemic, we've all had to be more human, haven't we? And I would love curriculum to just be a bit more open to and a bit more responsive to how we are in the world now. We need more support beyond just academia. We need professional, personal support as well. This is just a little video. So alongside the online material, we also try and meet up. We have, uh, we did our first residency last year, which was absolutely wonderful. And I took Suki along and that was really important for me to not actually hide my child away, to make it the benefits of it. You know, the benefits of it meant that it became a very family, a kind of very family supportive environment for everybody there. They kind of fed off that family vibe, I suppose rather than hiding away this child because there's so many positivities in bringing that to the center of the residency meant that we all just got that bit closer. We enjoyed our meal times a bit more. It wasn't about, oh, are we going to go and party tonight? It was about, you know, this kind of connection that would happen because Suki was there. So moving on to talk about a couple of pieces in my art practice, and it was really interesting putting this together actually because I you know I've been doing talks obviously I've been working whilst I've been pregnant I haven't really taken maternity leave um, but I have sort of looked back on this today it's the first talk I've done in this kind of idea of motherhood I feel like this is like my coming out <laughs> as a mother a mother artist um, and I thought 
wow, I'm going to talk about a couple of bits of work that I just don't know how I would do now. <laughs> and my work is autobiographical. So that merger of my life and using that personal and making it universal, those conversations. And it really began with this, with this looking at the other woman. I was with a married man for five years and he was the reason that I went to university. He took me out of my life in South London and he said, like, go and get an education. And he has helped, he supported me through those years. I really believed that I could do it. And that was really fundamental to where I am now. Of course, that raises a lot of, you know, a lot of issues, a lot of problems, a lot of challenges, because am I where I'm meant to be? Or was it because of this older man? You know, he, like, this allowed me to be this. You know, being the first person or only person to go to, your univer go to university, it can be quite challenging in the family dynamic. You know, it can, bring, it can bring things up and bring distance between siblings, the parents and family members. So it was a fundamental for me to have his support to do that. So I made a series around the other woman and I was interested very much in the language of when we think of a woman that is having a relationship with a married man, you know, even within you know, the language of the mistress, the bunny boiler, the home wrecker, you know, the lover, there's so many words to describe, but there's always you know, just the married man. So I met up with other women and I wanted to talk to them about what their position was and I made a series of images around it. From this work, I then went on and I wanted to really think more about this way of infidelity and this fictionalization of how we imagine affairs to be, to look, to act. You know, we are seen so much in the media or on sitcoms, on soap operas, this idea of what does an affair look like? And equally, I was reading Sigmund Freud at the time. He talked about in, in Beyond the Pleasure Principle, he talks about how if you repeat something that's traumatic, it will become pleasurable. So I decided to repeat seeing married men and in order to process where I was in my life at that time. And I repeated and I saw 80, I went on 80 dates with married men and I took a disposable camera with me and it took me about 18 months to do this. And they didn't know I was an artist and it wasn't about them individually. It was about this collective experience of you know, where were they taking me? How were they acting? How was I mirroring how they wanted me to be? And this, you know, I went on um, and had, this was one of the most interesting dates. He wanted to go to London Zoo. <laughs> and again, you know, in this image, people always read into this and say, wasn't it amazing the way you got the empty pram in the forefront of the image? But of course it was a complete accident. Often I wasn't even looking through the lens. I would just take a, a snap with a disposable camera. And they knew that I was taking pictures. Maybe I just took one. It was very interesting how they saw me when I took this plastic camera out of my bag because they're like, oh, she's harmless. You know, she's not a real artist, you know, with this toy camera. And it really became the way that I was able to operate to make this work is this assumption of how I should be and how I should act. Like belittling this little girl that thinks she's an artist. On the dates, I also took a, a, a recorder with me, which was never meant to be a piece of work. I did this for safety and I thought I just wanted this companion with me. And I made this recorder inside this purse and it recorded all what the men had said to me. Um, and it wasn't until I started working with the curator um, and Alistair Robinson at the Northern Gallery of Contemporary Art, I heard about this work and he said, wow, I want to get you funding. I want you to like let's let's see what we can do with this sound and we decided to just use the parting goodbye because obviously it's the real men's voices and it doesn't exist anywhere online it's only ever shown in the gallery space of them saying goodbye to me and so it's sometimes just an awkward silence or, or a train going past or big ben or can i have a kiss and uh, you know it, it and it's really interesting to hear in the gallery space whilst you look at this fragmented narrative of all of these actions of you know hands clasped or drinks empty and you really imagine what is being said and you come with it with your own assumptions if your dad had had an affair you'd obviously see this work in a different way if you're you know if you if you like to dress and you love a bit of fashion you might think would you wear that on a date I'd never wear that on a date <laughs> so it's, it's quite open in the way that this work is read 
from this series is quite a, a jump really. I just showed the, you that earlier work, which was, um, I wanted to show it to you because, you know, I work in this quite a performative way. I really immerse myself into the narratives and really become part of this story. My work takes one or two years normally to produce and I'm very, you know, I get very research heavy into the project. And this is actually a commission, so slightly different than the previous works. And it was a, a commission by the um, Open Data Institute, which is kind of set up by Sir Tim Berners-Lee. Sir Tim Berners-Lee was the inventor of the internet. So an amazing commission um, for me to become embedded as a residency for six months in the Open Data Institute. And you know it was amazing funding as well. And I was meant to make this piece of work that responded to open data. And you know, whilst living in this kind of like tech environment. And I decided to look at the divorce rates in the UK because I was really interested at how 42% of marriages end. And I just thought that was an amazing statistic of us believing that something's going to happen and really wanting this perfect marriage and you can just see actually in my sketchbook there on my desk this road trip that I went I went around the top 10 locations for divorce which interestingly were all coastal towns number one to number 10 and I took this road trip for six weeks traveling around and I've got a video that's going to tell you a little bit more about it which is two minutes long and this again is my sketchbook. I work you know, with a sketchbook, I have it with me all the time. It's very much my companion as I try and figure out how works are coming together. And I think that's really useful for me working autobiographically because I use those kind of almost like diaries to think, what do I want to show? And what don't I want to show? And always kind of leaving that little bit of distance um, between my, my life and putting it out there for the audience. So it's not just about me. There's enough space for them to imagine their, their own, you know, I kind of give them questions, I suppose. And with this series, I also made a curtain of broken dreams. So I had to learn um, like jewellery design and I work with jewellery designers where I bought wedding rings, discarded wedding rings during the road trip. And this is me here. I worked with um, jewellery designers at the University of the Creative Arts in Rochester, something completely new to me. And this was the curtain here. So this is the little video I'm just gonna play, um, which talks a bit about the series. Divorce Index and Curtain of Broken Dreams is a sculptural and film piece, which really coincides by looking at the divorce rates in the UK and this idea of happiness that when you put this mythical ring on your finger, you're going to be happy forever. But interestingly, with this piece of work, I really use data as the research and basis, because in fact, 42% of marriages end. And that's an amazing statistic that people believe that when they put that ring on their finger, everything's going to be perfect. And in the exhibition, you walk through this curtain of broken dreams where you're really invited as the audience to sort of, you see yourself in this mirror below and you're asked, just sort of question your own ideas around marriage, your own ideas of what you feel is going to be perfect. And the piece of work looked at the divorce hotspots around the UK. I went on a road trip and during that time I collected wedding rings from cash converters, from pawn shops and also from Kiss Me Quick on the seaside. And I actually created a data set of 1% of the divorces in the UK, 1,640 rings. And on that road trip, I was alone and I actually stayed with divorcee men, which I found through Airbnb. And when I was there, I really kind of asked them about divorce and embodied this idea of what it'd be like to have those struggles in my own marriage. Because in fact, when you look at those 10 hotspots of divorce, you really start to see that there are other things that come into play, the other things in your life that can pull you apart. However much do you want your marriage to be perfect, things like high waiting times at the NHS, age, education, high gambling rates in some of the towns. At the end of the road trip, I got back into my wedding clothes and I met my husband who was also in his wedding clothes and we performed the gestures of divorce, looking at those words again like gambling, old age, and really went through this process of thinking about what are the struggles that we will have in our own marriage.
So I was really reflecting on this idea of the freedom of being able to go on a road trip for six weeks, the freedom of <laughs> missing my wedding anniversary, my first wedding anniversary to go and do this and to make this work. And actually, isn't that amazing that I could do that? And how does that fit, how, how does that fit now for me being a mother <laughs> um, with making this work? Um, and this is how it looked. So in the exhibition, um, you know, it was a, it was a floating um, cinema and you'd walk through this curtain and you'd see this, this um, video behind. I'm going to move on to a final series, which is I've actually made this um, during the pandemic and this kind of continuation of thinking or questioning how how things should be, how relationships should be. I almost as though there's this pedestal of love, this pedestal of relationships that we're taught since, you know, looking at Disney, <laughs> reading fairy tales from a young age. And I suppose I try and disrupt that and talk about the realities. And this was one reality for me is when I was um, on my fifth wedding anniversary, I went to India with my husband. And one morning I woke up and I reached out and I thought for a moment that I was in bed with my ex married man. And I didn't think that I was with him. And that was really haunting for me. And I decided that well, after much turmoil of, you know, a couple of months thinking, am I meant to be with him? Am I meant to be back with married man? Who am I meant to be with? And why have I started to think about this man again from my past? And I thought, what would happen if I put these two men together in a photograph? And I went on a quest to ask Simon, my husband, if he would be photographed with the ex-married man together naked in an image. And the series was called Muse on Muse. So I would stand there and take the photograph of the two men together. And maybe that would make everything okay. So the series is a narrative of, of over a couple of years where I go on this quest to try and find this photograph. And when I met up with a married man that I hadn't seen for five years, I asked him, would you do this for me? And he said, what do I get out of it? Um, which I should have expected. And he said, I wanna spend the night with you in a hotel. And if you do that, then I'll allow you to take my photograph with Simon. So I then had to ask Simon and he said, um, yeah, well, I didn't tell him <laughs> and I went to try and do it secretly, but I chickened out and then he said, no, you need to go and do it. So I took a watch camera on this 24 hours that I spent with Married Man. And the, the work becomes this story of me trying to get this image, having this watch camera, going to the hotel and then trying to take this work. So these are some of the scenes inside the hotel, which I had to do in order to get the photograph. I also took a disposable camera with me and I took a few snaps when I was there. And when I came back to my house, all Simon did was he picked up the camera from the bed and he took two images and he said, just wash your clothes. And we never really talked about it again. And then I had to try and think, okay, well, how am I gonna take this photograph now? I've now got permission from the married man and from my husband to take this image. But something happened, you know, I, I became pregnant during this time. And it was an amazing shift for me where I was so kind of turmoiled of how do I want to be as a woman, who I'm meant to be with, even though I was married very happily. And suddenly by finding out I was pregnant and being in a pandemic, which was quite incredible to be in a pandemic and just by complete coincidence to be making a piece of work that was about skin touching, about two people's skin touching at that time. And suddenly we weren't allowed to touch skin anymore. And so the work really became, really changed actually. And the work became about me having this daughter and having a different skin to touch. And the work is presented as this story, which was from my diary, from me waking up the moment that that dream happened to then nestling with my daughter and saying, I've got my own skin on skin now. I don't need to take that photograph anymore. And that making of that work, all of that work happened um, and kind of resolved, like this exhibition resolved during, um, I was three months, um, I had Suki, she was eight months old, sorry, eight weeks old when I went to France to organize this exhibition. And it was a big survey show, an early survey show, so eight series of my works all together, looking at 15 years of work. And I had to take my daughter with me. And you know, behind those beautiful install shots, of course, there is a lot of negotiation. 
there's me in the top corner there. And I didn't expect, I didn't know what I expected to be taking my daughter with me. I knew I had to, obviously, I was breastfeeding. And I didn't think I'd be getting in my tips out and breastfeeding during meetings, discussing the exhibition. But it was actually fantastic. It was such an amazing experience in France where it really didn't matter at all. This is me at the opening, sitting in the corner, feeding and doing a press tour whilst holding Suki. And, you know, it was, everyone was absolutely charming. Everyone was absolutely, well, of course, it was, it was as though it wasn't even questioned, why would I have my daughter there? It was like, absolutely, you can have your daughter there. And then this is the, the film screening of that work that I showed you, Muse on Muse, is actually a film. So it's a, a 12 minute film, which yeah, will be premiered in the UK shortly. So it's quite a lot to discuss in you know, five minutes that work, but in the film, you really see this, this journey into motherhood, this journey of not sure the place in the world. And then suddenly, completely bizarrely, it wouldn't be something that I expected, this, this shift for me, the shift of my outlook, the shift of how I see myself <laughs> on the planet of having this daughter. And the exhibition that I have on right now, um, which is another solo show in, in France, they asked, they, they commissioned me to make a piece of work um, for that show. There's three different new series in it. And they asked me to make an image of how I felt now being a mother. Um, and I decided to make this work called Together at Last. And it's one single image. And I felt quite embarrassed actually um, to make a piece of work that was about happiness. That was the brief, make a piece of work about happiness. <laughs> and, um, so I decided to shoot it just in front of my house and to just think about that image that we have in our mind of what happiness looks like, this image of how we, you know, we're sort of told this universal image and me embodying it. Um, so it's kind of a bit tongue in cheek, I suppose, and that exists in the gallery quite as a large image there. Um, and this is what the show looks like right now in France. And it, and it talks about this journey of finding this together at last, finding this togetherness um, within my work, within my being a mother and how I feel right now. And this is um, some of the, um, how the install work there, because I think this is another great example um, just to end on, is that when I turned up for that show, previously in the show in um, Mujon, which I showed you a moment ago, Simon came with me on that trip and the annoying thing actually is that maybe they could have paid for his flight. They paid for everything else, but I had to pay for his flight because I needed him to be supportive. She was only so young. But with this show, um, Suki being um, one years old, I had to go by myself for a week. So I took her for a week. I did a five day install and then we did the opening. And actually the gallery again were fantastic. They had pre-prepared the gallery. They'd made her a cot room. They'd made her, all, they'd put all these toys together. They'd even covered all of the plugs in the gallery. They'd even covered the corners of the seats so that they, they put like um, foam on the corners of anything sharp. And I turned up there and I saw all of the preparation that they had made. And I thought, wow, I just couldn't imagine this happening in the UK. I couldn't imagine them being like, well, of course, you know, you, of course you're gonna bring your baby, you know. And they'd prepared food for her. And I just felt so supported. And I really feel in a very privileged position, even giving this talk and um, hearing some of those stories that Hetty has said of, I don't know whether it's the pandemic, but I've had this really fantastic supportive introduction to becoming an artist mother. But it has led to me thinking about how do I do my work now? So I have just been on a course, you know, thinking about textile and thinking about craft, which, of, you know, there is obviously a stereotype around, oh, you're just going to make craft now and you're going to make domestic work. But actually, the idea of domesticity coming into my work and, and, and changing where I can't go on these big road trips, I can't go and chase and date married men. I mean, can you imagine? It's just I cannot do it now. <laughs> um, but I, I'm thinking about how can I sort of shift things um, whilst, of course, you know, me being an artist, I'm always going to make. So it's about finding the way that I can keep going and keep kind of using and taking the ideas from me and utilizing them and putting them out into the world. And for me right now, the experiment that I'm doing with textiles is, you know, it's really, um, yeah, it's really shifting and it's really given me quite a lot that I didn't ever expect. 
and that is just we can come back to that if you want to see some of the install shots there's my website there thank you so much